Okay, this is the book, whoever wants to see it. It's called Beloved of My Soul. It's in Hebrew and English. And it's letters of our master and teacher, Rav Yudha Tzvi Brenwein, to his beloved student, Kabbalist Rav Berg, edited by Michael Berg. So we're going to be reading the first letter, because I think it's a very important message. Oh. Here we go. Letter one. With help from the Creator, Tel Aviv, Friday, Eve of Shabbat, portion of Korach, second day of the month of Tammuz, 5724, June the 12th, 1964. Many greetings, fullness of joy, and all best wishes to the honorable, beloved among men, master of wisdom and master of many deeds, our teacher, Rav Shriger Favel, may you merit a long and good life. Amen. After greeting you with great love, I have returned today from the holy city, Jerusalem. May it be rebuilt and reestablished speedily in our days. Amen. After having been there all week. I have nothing in particular to write regarding the Yeshiva, Spiritual Academy, except for the fact that they study and pray throughout the whole week. I was giving them a class every day for about two hours. I worked hard, but it was well worth the effort. We must pay attention to the money that they receive, so that even though it might be used now for studying Torah, not for its own sake, eventually it will serve the purpose, stated in the Talmud Sanhedrin 105b, from doing not for its own sake, one will come to do it for its own sake. And when does this apply? When the student sees and feels the hidden light of life in our holy Torah, as the verse says, for whoever finds me finds life. Then his study of the Torah will become unto him an elixir of life, and then I am certain that he will not withdraw from it, for who would want to withdraw from life? Being in the week of the portion of Korach, I thought that I should expound a little upon the subject, and Korach took Numbers 16.1. Rashi, a blessed memory, commented, he took himself to one side, etc., or as Onkelos translated, he separated himself. The meaning of one side can be understood by explaining the two questions that Korach asked Moses. Must a talis prayer shawl, that is completely techelet, biblical shade of blue, have a tzitzis, or is it exempt from this requirement? And does a house full of books need a mezuzah or not? What did Korach intend by asking those two questions? And what is concealed within these two questions? The issue is that the entire idea of doing the spiritual work for the Creator, as well as the entire Torah itself, is contained in these questions. For there are two ways of doing the spiritual work for the Creator. The first is the path of emunah, trust, certainty, as the ox is to the yoke and as the donkey is to the burden. Talmud, Avodah Zarah, 5b. As it is said in the verse, God, you bring salvation to man and beast. Psalms 36, 7, referring to those people who are devoid of all knowledge and who put themselves as beasts, not knowing, not grasping or seeing, literally like a beast. This is called a talit that is completely techelet. Techelet is derived from the Hebrew words tichle, purpose and result, and chileon, extinction, elimination. As it is written, Psalms 119, 96, I have seen an end for every purpose. This refers to people who forgo all possible knowledge and comprehension and take upon themselves to wrap themselves with a garment that is a talent of trust in order not to know just like a beast. The word tzitzis is derived from the word mitzitz, meaning seeing or looking. As in he looks mitzitz through the lattice, Songs of Songs 2.9. This refers to those who leave a place in their heart so that if there would be a revelation of goodwill from the Creator, then they would perceive, know, and understand. As it says, Know the Creator, the Lord of, the, of your Father. Chronicles 28.9 And according to the secret of the verse, your eyes shall see your teachers. Isaiah 30.20 As it is written regarding Moses, and he sees the vision of the Creator. Numbers 12.8 And in many other places. This was Moses' answer. It is true that as far as we are concerned, we accept upon ourselves a simple trust as the ox is to the yoke 
and as the donkey is to the burden. Yet if it is the Creator's will for us to work for Him like humans, to understand and to perceive, we should not say no. Rather, after we accept being like beasts, we should also leave a place and an illusion opening to the tzitzis, namely to know and understand. If only we could recognize and know that this is the will of the Creator, who is kindly welcoming us into His holy Torah, and this is the meaning of a talis that is currently tchelet, requires a tzitzis. Just a second. The same esoteric meaning applies to the sukkah, which is termed the shade of trust, Zohar Emor 264, because it alludes to trust. Nevertheless, a thickly covered sukkah is unfit for use because space should be left through which the stars can be seen, since the light of the stars alludes to the lights of the Creator. Writings of the Ari. Gate of Meditations 2, page 306, which shine upon us into the sukkah, which is the trust. Similarly, Korach also asked about a house full of books, alluding to a person who has attained wisdom and has knowledge and full realization of the Creator's existence and can see and understand everything that is in the Torah. This man still needs a mezuzah, which signifies trust, because it is this trust that protects us always from all the negative and external spirits that mean us harm. This is in accordance with the secrets of the word mezuzot, which consists of the same letters as zaz mavit, remove death, because death cannot enter a house fitted with a mezuzah. Moses said to Korach that even a house full of books, a person with full awareness, still does not always remain in the same state. If heaven forbid he finds himself confronting concealment of face, even then he should not regress. One must never believe in oneself completely and say that he has already attained everlasting knowledge and therefore does not need to have trust. Thus, even a house full of books needs a mezuzah, trust, for protection from all kinds of situations. These two pathways, trust and knowledge, are called fire and water. It is written that the Torah is likened to fire, as in, it is not my word like a fire. The Torah is also likened to water, as in the secret of the verse, Ho, everyone that thirsts, go to the water. Yet water and fire are two complete opposites, and one destroys the other. Water extinguishes fire, and fire dries up water. In the physical world, what does one who has cold water do when he's thirsty, but cannot drink the water because it's too cold? Yet he has a fire, but cannot put the water directly on the fire, because it would extinguish the flames. He puts the water inside a vessel, and places the vessel with the water upon the fire. And now in that manner, the vigor of the fire goes into the water. Now he drinks the hot water that is composed of fire and water. The vessel has made peace between the fire and the water, and he can now enjoy both of them, fire and water together. This is the secret of what our sages have said. He who sees a cooking pot in his dream can expect peace. The same applies in spirituality to those two paths that have been mentioned. The two paths contradict each other. They have been likened to fire and water, and are called two sides, right and left, namely trust and knowledge. But knowledge contradicts trust and vice versa. He who follows the path of the Torah, Moses' teachings, becomes like a vessel that makes peace and unites the opposites and the different sides. According to the verse, the Creator did not find a vessel that contained blessing for Israel other than peace. Talmud Uktzim, chapter 3. The one who makes peace is the vessel, referred to above. And this person becomes like a vessel in the hands of the Creator, for both sides and ends are unified in him. This is how he becomes a chariot for the central column, which is the essence of Moses, Zor Yitro, 22, the attribute of Tiferet, as in the verse, a crown of Tiferet splendor you have given him to Moses. This is how a person comes to enjoy both ends, paths, trust and knowledge. He comes to this realization of having no doubt about whether he exists or is alive, even though he does not see the light of life with his physical eyes. And this is how he achieves full acknowledgement of God's existence, according to the verse, know the Creator, the Lord of your Father, and serve him with full and clear knowledge. This, however, was not the case with Korach, who wanted only one side, either trust or knowledge. This is why he failed and was punished. 
Review thoroughly what I have said because I do not have the time to go into further details at the moment. Please inform me if you have already procured a license to collect funds for the yeshiva. The chairman of the Knesset, Mr. Kaddish Luz, has made an appointment for me in his office for Sunday. Wishing all the best, Yehuda Tzvi. What do you think? I liked it. The reason I, 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 I uh, showed this letter is because um, a lot of the time happens where we, we want to choose two extremes. So we either go for just knowledge and we'll learn the books and we don't need any faith or, or any um, annulment or anything like that. And we'll just go just for the knowledge. And we also have a tendency to go the, in the opposite direction where we only want to annul. And we'll, we don't need to know anything. We'll just do what our teacher tells us to. We're in complete annulment. And the idea is on each um, opposition, we don't reach anything. We need both. Um, um, we need both, uh, both types. We need to also have knowledge and also have um, faith. And before the barrier, we'll be mostly spending time in our faith. And after the barrier, we'll be spending more time in our knowledge, but we still need both of them, both before and after. I believe both those sides would be called fundamentalists. <laughs> Being on, to, on just on one side, that's very fundamental. I think... It's odd that to get to the barrier, you use faith, and after the barrier, you use your barrier, you use your knowledge, because I would think it'd be the opposite, because you would need the knowledge to know how to attain the barrier, and then once you're past the barrier, things would be very different. Well, the thing is that when we're talking about knowledge, we're not just talking about what's written in the books. Um, we would also talk about attainment. So the idea is before the barrier, you don't have much of that. And therefore, most of the time, you're going to be um, uh, basically having faith in somebody else who will help you, you know, give you concepts, clean your concepts and stuff like that. Um, well, after the barrier, you, have, you don't have any need now to clean the concepts before the barrier. Now you're cleaning concepts after. So it's like you've got this teacher and student role, like constantly interweaving with each other. I have one more question. They were talking about a house of books also needs something at the doorway. The is this the item that, what is it? The mezuzah, yeah, it's the item in the, on, the, um, um, on the doorpost where you normally kiss it when you, when you leave, the, the, leave or enter the room. And it's a, it's a sign for, for, um, for faith. I see, okay, because I thought that's what it was describing but I just wanted to make sure I understand, you know, the text and what, what's being said. Thank you. Perfectly. Does the mezuzah have scripture in it, or is it just a blessing for the house? No, it has the, it has, it has the Shema in it. Okay. If I remember correctly, it has at least the Shema. Um, and, it, and it said in the article about uh, mezuzah, got the word Zaz Mavit, which is death moves. So it's, it's basically um, uh, a sign for wanting faith. So you have a, so the question was, if you have a house full of books with everything in it, like even a Sefer Torah, and you have, you know, loads of, um, you know, Kabbalah books and everything, why would I need a mezuzah still? Um, and the concept is there, you also see that need that faith. You're saying that that's completely right line right there? That's the complete right line? When you kiss the mezuzah right there, it's a symbol of the right line? The right line is um, the faith. Yeah. Well, then is faith and left line is knowledge. Right. Um, Shelley had a question. Isn't knowledge used with the mind? Wouldn't one use what is in one's heart? So the idea is the knowledge is always in the mind, but it needs to be um, felt in the heart. It's like even if you love someone, you still have some knowledge awareness of who that person is. So it's, it's never just emotion alone. In fact, um, there's a, a saying of... Uh, that emotion is the glue for the mind. So the idea is the things that we remember are things that we have an emotion attached to it. So if I just learn a book, I can learn it all day and all night, and it doesn't mean I remember anything. Because normally what I'll remember is either something I get frustrated with, which is also an emotion, or something I really, really love, which is also an emotion. So the things that we remember 
is always to do with emotion. That's why we can go sometimes to, through lessons with Rav Lightman three hours a day. And you ask someone an hour after the lesson is over, how was it? And he'll be like, it was great. And you ask him, do you remember anything? And he's like, no. And the reason is, is because there was no emotion there. So it just went right through his mind and there was no, ve the vessels are emotion. The vessels stick when you have knowledge that hit them and then they stick into, the, into those vessels made from the combination of knowledge and emotion. So if you just have knowledge, you won't remember anything. Or even if you remember everything, it won't have any emotional value. So it's just as useless. It's like knowing all, um, you know, uh, a lot of, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, uh, trivial things, like trivial knowledge that won't actually help you on your path. So you'll have people that they'll know maybe many chapters of Talmud Esesferiot by heart, but it's got nothing to do with their development. Um, it would be like someone knowing all the pop star songs. It doesn't actually help him. So on your development, the only things that actually stick are things that are the combination of knowledge and emotion together. Um, so those who just stick to emotion, again, the right line, will never reach anything because they've only got emotion and emotion comes and goes and they've got nothing for it to stick in. And people that only go for you know, attainment, they only want to go for knowledge, and they're like, I don't need the friends. I don't need any sort of meeting. I'll just uh, learn the books day and night. They also won't reach anything because you need to cultivate the combination of your emotion and your knowledge. I think what is said is that when you have a thought and there's no feeling behind it, then it's philosophy. So when there's emotion behind it, then it's um, Kabbalah. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's got to be the combination. Philosophy. It's got to be the combination of it. It's like there's the three levels of unnecessary, um, impossible, and secrets. And this is in uh, disclosing a portion in, of Bala Sulam. Unnecessary is when you think things are outside of you, and necessary is when you think they're inside you, when you make them part of you. That's how you first pass that first restriction. The second restriction you pass is turning something impossible to possible. And how do you do that? Normally, when we read stuff, we read things as talking about the past. And that makes them stay impossible since you can never desire something in the past. It's in the past. If it happened 16 billion years ago before the big bang, you can't desire to be in those states. It's already happened. So the only way for you to make that from impossible to possible is to understand it's not talking about things that happened. It's talking about things that will happen to you. It's states of attainment that you go through. So when we're reading what a Kabbalist wrote, we're writing what he attained and we're meant to attain it in the same way. So we're not trying to learn what he attained. We're trying to learn it so that we can attain it ourselves. And that's turning impossible to possible. And then we can get to the final uh, restriction, which is secrets, is learning um, the certain ways how the Kabbalists write, um, that they sometimes invert stuff. So like I wrote in, like, in my last article that uh, sin is advancement, where uh, it'll say, you know, woe to those and those who sin will go through all these punishments. And they're actually talking about this is how you advance. So they write it on purpose to hide people that aren't ready for advancement. And they'll look at it and they'll be like scared, like, oh, I don't want to lose my next world or I don't want to lose. I don't want to have pain. And then they just skip it. And for those who actually want to advance and they have been through pain and they don't care about going through pain to advance, they read it. Oh, this is what I, these are the steps I actually have to go through. So you're saying using the, uh, the Kabbalist experience as kind of a recipe, we can actually attain it that way? Exactly. They, in the order they wrote it is the order we attain it. So we actually attain it in the order of we first are in the Bechina um, Aleph, which is humanity. Then we go to Bechina Bet, which is spiritual society. Then Bechina Gimel, which is the group. And then we reach Bechina Dalet, which is the individual. When we've reached the maximum desire to, to receive the primacy of the creator, which is Bechina Dalet, then we pass the barrier, which is the first symptom. And then um, we get our first screen, which is when we already are part of the creator. So the order that we learn it is the order we actually attain it. Um, but it's hidden. So it's written as if it's something that happened when a creature of some sort, something happened to it. We've got to understand that the creature is us. And they'll purposely hide it that way so that uh, um, uh, those who are not ready will just think of it as something happening you know, to somebody else, something outside of them. So the Kabbalist is writing, writing from the past for other people in the future. Exactly. They're, they're writing it as if it's in the past, but they experienced it in their present. Um, okay, I understand. Um, and, and then suddenly, if you, if you 
deal with these three restrictions and you incorporate them into your learning, suddenly it makes much more sense and then you can actually, um, uh, you can get to enjoy the lessons more. Instead of it being about something, it's, instead of being a history lesson, which is impossible, it turns into a, um, a, a hope lesson, into a desire lesson, into a, something you're gonna go through, like a course or a syllabus that you can actually want to go through. Um, Shelley asks, um, will one know when you reach the barrier? Will it be an emotional experience with knowledge? Yes, you know when you reach the barrier. Even beforehand, you, what you go through is you go through a state of the, you think that maybe you passed, maybe you haven't passed, and then very quickly you'll understand that you haven't passed. You get these like feelings, like emotions of like, um, uh, like maybe I'm there, maybe I'm not. It's like, you know, are we there yet with kids? Where you're on the way and then towards the end they're like, so we're there, right? So we're there, right? And you're like, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. And then basically when you can't convince yourself that you haven't passed, then you know you've passed. Rav writes in his book, The Arvut, he writes, when you're 100% um, in, um, in the intention, that is when the intention becomes your state. So instead of you thinking of an intention, you are in a state of intention, that is when you pass the barrier. So beforehand, we're like thinking of our intention, we're reading an intention, we're thinking about our intention. When we're in an intention, that means when our day is from day to night, 100% thoughts of intention, then I've become that part of the creator, then, then I've passed the barrier. And that's what he writes there. When 100% you're in that, 24 hours, he says, when you're 24 hours in, in the intention, you pass the barrier. Shelley writes, is that when you are only concentrate on pleasing the creator? That's when you are the creator. <laughs> um, so you're pleasing yourself. What do you think, Dennis? <laughs> I'm just letting, uh, letting your words just kind of uh, wash over me because uh, some of this I've heard before and others, it's in a new way. Um, I guess what I've been always hearing is it's gonna take a long time to pass the barrier and nobody's done that. And I kind of think, really, nobody? Nobody's done that? <laughs> so, it, this, this is a new, a new learning. Part of the problem is that um, if someone has passed and he starts bragging to everybody that he has passed, there's, when there's, where, where is the equality in the workshop? So. Um, when our Rav was asked a few weeks ago, and then he blatantly like told everybody, no one's passed, no one, which is funny because, you know, what kind of guy comes and says, I've sold no products. If anybody told you that I sold a product, they're wrong. I've sold no products. Um, but he's basically saying it because when people normally, it normally happens to people which are at the beginning of their path and they're just learning these stuff and they're like, oh, I'm there. And then they brag to everybody, look, I've passed the barrier. When you actually pass the barrier, you don't tell anyone. Um, apart from basically your, your closest friend that you've, you've grown with, you've done the path with, but you're not going to brag to anybody, look, I've passed the barrier. It's not something you do. Just like uh, when you love someone, really love someone, you don't start running around to everybody, I love them. Um, you normally do that with a flick or, or like a, a puppy love or something like that. You like run around to everyone in school and say, look, I love this girl. But when it, it's a deep love, you tend to keep it to yourself. And it's not because you don't want to share it with others. You just don't feel the need to. Um, and that's another sign you can like know that it's true because you, you it's not that you, you want to hide it from people. You just don't feel the need to express it. And Rav has to like say that no one's passed because you don't want, when someone's in a workshop, they have to show their equality and you don't want someone saying, Oh, I've passed and therefore you all need to teach me special. I can understand that. Bragging about what we have instead of, Focusing on what you're into. Exactly. I just had a thought when you said that about the love. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm just. Um, My kids are driving me crazy. Um, that I think what you just said is it, it goes to when it, it's true, then you trust it and you have faith in it. So there's no need to get confirmation from others. So when we're expressing it to others, like, oh, I love this person, we're almost looking for 
um, confidence and confirmation from the other to um, to make us feel okay in it. And when you are okay in it, there's no need to express it because it's it's right. I totally agree. And Shelley writes, what is meant with dreams of the spiritual awareness, such as dreaming of tests that shall come? Part of the funny thing about um, growing in spirituality is you never know what the next step is. And even if you uh, would know the name of the next step, you have no clue what it actually means emotionally. Um, so unless you, until you actually go through it, you don't actually know what is going to happen. So you can't even dream of what can happen since you have no, you could say, you don't have the vessels to even imagine it. It would be like trying to imagine before the barrier, what is it like crossing the barrier? So even if someone, it's like saying to someone, you know, oh, um, I love a certain person so much. Just because I say it to somebody else doesn't mean the other person will understand what it means. Uh, we see this many times with, when, when parents tell kids about stuff um, and the kids just don't have the vessels to even understand like, what they're talking about. Um, it's like giving a sex, edu sex education to a five-year-old. Like, he doesn't have the vessels to even understand what you're talking about. So, you know, it, it just won't register him. And he'll, he might even say, oh, I understand what you mean. But when he tries to express it in his own words, you see that he has no clue. Do any of you, like, I would like to hear your comments on what you think of the whole concept of the... Um, the vessel of peace that makes um, peace between the fire and the water. Do you have any comments? Well, it's the harmonizer. It's, it's making harmony out of them. And that's how everything goes. It's within harmony. Kind of makes me feel like uh, how things go in life. You have some good days, you got some bad days, you got some good days and bad days. When you take a look at it, it kind of equalizes off. I, I want to make sure I understand the question. Could you restate it one more time, please? We talked in the article about that um, the vessel, the vessel piece. Um, makes uh, the vessel makes peace between fire and water. So you've got two opposites, and you want to like cool. You want to cool. You want to uh, warm up the water, but how can you do so? Because water and fire are two opposites, and then you've got the vessel that makes peace between the fire and the water. So the water can get heated by the fire without getting extinguished by it. I don't know, I kind of akin it to like uh, with faith, I think when everyone starts this journey, their faith is kind of like fire. It, it burns up. They want to know everything and they're really consumed by it. And I think that through the group, we change our vessels uh, that I would hope at some point we are at least slowly changing our vessels from reception to bestowal. And when you, I think of bestowal, I think of this is the type of once you're in bestowal, uh, it's the type of faith that is like running water. Uh, even though it's fluid, it can move around things, uh, obstacles uh, easily and so forth. It also has the, uh, the ability to change matter. Like if water runs over a stone, uh, the stone over time will uh, begin, begin to change. I think one of the hardest problems for people when they're learning Kabbalah is this concept of receiving bestowal because it sounds opposite. How can I receive bestowal? And the thing is that before the burial, what we're basically working on is wanting to receive that bestowal. And what passing the barrier means that I've, re I've received, um, I've become bestowal and now I'm using bestowal in the minute amount. Um, so part of the problem is that we want to feel like we're already there but then it extinguishes our desire. So it's like, oh, I'm meant to just bestow, so I'll bestow now. But you've got nothing to bestow with. 
It's like a poor person learning about how he needs to give money to others. And then he's like immediately, oh, I'll give my, my money to others. Like, no, you first need to become a millionaire before you can give money to others. So it's the same thing. We first we need to become the creator before we can bestow like him. And those com it's a very conflict for us to understand I'm receiving bestow, but isn't receiving, like if I'm receiving 100%, aren't I the opposite from the creator? But then, but I actually want to receive bestowal. So aren't then I the closest to the creator? And that whole conflict is what basically decides what people actually, what people actually pass the bury and who don't. Those who can um, become that vessel of peace that can make, um, like resolve the conflict within themselves that yes, I want to become the creator in order to bestow. That means I want to receive 100% the creator within me. Then I can bestow as him. Those are the ones who actually pass. And all the, all the people that get stuck beforehand is because they want to already act as if they're already bestowing, even though they haven't actually got the quality yet. And then they just stop. They, they kill their desire. They're like, oh, I'm just meant to want it for the friends instead of wanting it for me. Or, oh, I'll just let everybody else pass and, and then I'll pass. And all these are basically um, excuses we use for ourselves to, to not want to desire to pass. Hey Rick, how you doing? Good, how you all doing? I didn't know if anybody was still gonna be here. I just seen the email, so I sat down and turned on the computer on Zoom. I can give you a summary. Basically we read, maybe I'll just read the summary of the article and maybe that'll help you. Because oh, I have a summary for each article. Um, a second. So this is the book again, Beloved of My Soul. Okay. And it's the summary of letter one. So I'll read the summary. So he writes, information about the yeshiva, the spiritual academy, explanation of the idea of Torah for its own sake, explanation of the Rashi commentary about Korach taking himself to one side, Explanation of the questions of Korach, Mr. Talit, a prayer shawl that is completely blue, have its tzitzis, fringes, or it is exempt from this requirement. And does a house full of books need a mezuzah or not? Why we must always follow two paths, one of knowledge, the other of faith. Discussions of Moshe's answer, one with utmost faith must leave a place for knowledge, and a man of wisdom has to go with faith as well. And only by following the two paths together is it possible to be saved from falling? These two paths are like water and fire. Man is like a vessel that established peace between them, like a vessel which contains water over fire and makes it warm. So we were talking about how we need, we have a tendency to choose one or the other. So we either are in complete faith and then we annul and we just want to do what we're told and, and have no opinion of ourselves. We want to like get rid of our ego. Or we go to the other extreme, we're only about our ego, we only care about what we know, we don't want to annult anybody else, we'll just reach it with our you know, own knowledge or with the books that we'll do it, and we'll reach. And you basically need both. So the right line where you are only annulling is considered like a prayer shawl of tchelet without the fringes. So the idea is you also need a blue string on the fringes, which represents uh, knowledge. So even if you're in complete faith, you still need knowledge. And a house full of books... You still need a mezuzah, which is the thing, the, um, the device that you kiss when you go out through the door. Um, we'll see okay, the, by the door that you go in and out, right? Exactly. Okay. And th that's to show, even if you have a house full of Torah books, which has got even all the, um, all, there's a parsha in the mezuzah of Shema, even if you have it in all the books, you still need that device on the door, because even if you're full of knowledge, you still need faith. And that's yes. to help the people of right line and left line. Accordingly. But those are metaphors for, uh, I mean, that are, aren't they just really metaphors for that the mezuzah is symbolizing faith and the books are symbolizing knowledge, which is knowledge in the creator, knowledge, and the faith is the internal power. These are just um, metaphors, aren't they? Right. Kissing the mezuzah won't get you to pass the barrier. Yes. <laughs> But it's but it but it's been it's a it's a it's the concept that's been materialized. Exactly. It's to reinforce the idea of faith. 
with you when you leave your home or come in that you have to mingle the two is what I would think, you know, from my friends. I'm not Jewish or, you know, follow it, but I do know some people that have them. And the way they explained it to me was like similar to what Zachakai said, but uh, he did it with much more detail. <laughs> Let's put it like that. They're like a code, and, and, and when you look behind the material, the image of it, the coding within it is saying that this is a symbol. A symbol of it. Yeah. 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 I give an example for physical uh, mitzvahs, physical commandments, like when you give your wife a or your sibling a flowers. So if someone steals those flowers, you'll be like, ah, I stole the love of the other person. I didn't steal anything. That's just a symbol between me and the other person. So just right. hitting the symbol or you then saying, oh, you, you just need to give flowers, I'll give flowers to someone. It's, the flowers is a symbol of a relationship between me and another person or between me and the creator. So just if someone sees me kissing mezuzah and then he goes and kisses mezuzah, like, well, he reached it. He reached love by kissing mezuzah, so I can reach love by kissing mezuzah. Like, no, it's just a symbol. And the problem is when people take the symbols and make it into the thing itself, and then you have the other extreme where people are like, oh, I don't have to do any symbols at all. She knows she loves me or he knows he loves me. And then we don't do any kind of symbol at all. And those are the two extremes. So it's the same thing as uh, when scripture says you don't have to remember the law because it's inscribed on your heart. It just becomes part of you. Exactly. You know, the, the two extremes that you just talked about is sounds like the fire and the water that um, merged in your uh, analogy. Yeah, heating the water. Yeah, heating the water to drink it. Correct. That's why I wanted to read this letter because it's a very important concept. And I see in the society, we constantly um, uh, confront this issue and deal with this issue. Like, are we meant to be in 100% annulment and do whatever the Rav says? And that's one side of people that choose. And the other side is, no, we're meant to do exactly what we want to do. And we are the deciders and we decide, which is the other extreme. And of course, the solution is, is a combination between the two. So even if you um, annul to the teacher, you want to annul in order to become the teacher. So you're not annulling to, in order to be a good student, because good students never become teachers. A, you want to become the teacher. So you don't want to just annul to the teacher because that's what the teacher said. You want to annul to the teacher in order to um, become him. And again, so that's the combination of your desire, which is at the left line, with your annulment of the right line. And, it, and it's very hard for people to sort of combine the two. What are you saying? I'm meant to want to become him. That's a left line. That's an egoistic thing. I want to become the teacher. I want to replace him. But on the other hand, I'm annulling, which is the right line, which is you know, reducing my ego. And it's hard for people to put those two concepts into one. Is that like empowerment and, and, and holding your independence as well? Exactly. I, I normally call it that you have the right line, which is the goal. And you've got the left line, which is your discernments. And you're injecting the left line into the right line. And making you're them them, bigger. mixing them together. Exactly. It's like, if I told you, can you make a balloon bigger without breathing into it? And you're trying to pull it and you're like, no, it's not getting bigger. I don't understand that. You know, I saw somebody else have a big balloon. Why can't I do it? And the reason is, is because you need to blow air into the balloon. And the result of you blowing air into the balloon is the balloon grows. So you don't actually make the balloon grow. You're injecting the air into it. And the result is that the balloon grows. So the same concept, we don't actually have control of our desires. We have control of our discernments. So the discernments is the air we're blowing into the balloon, but the discernments then become a desire in it, which actually grow the balloon to the size that we need. We don't actually, when we're blowing the air into the balloon, we don't have to think, okay, this air is going to go to the left. This air is going to go to the right. This is going to push it up. It's going to push it down. We don't need to worry about that. All we need to do is use the right discernments and inject them into our goal, which is the right line. And then the balloon will grow accordingly. That's what we mean that we only have to do half the work. Our half the work is just to collect the discernments. That's why we meet the friends. That we, that's why we uh, read the books. And we want that emotion to stick, make that glue to stick together. The result will be that we'll get a desire and it will actually grow. But we don't have to do that part. That is the result of our actions, not the action itself. So that's working with the creator then when uh, you're 
you're learning to discern um, by blowing, you know, inserting the air into the balloon, you're working with the creator with your different um, things that you work with as far as um, your beliefs, your, your um, knowledge, your emotions and everything. It's, it's all merging and working with the creator then, right? Exactly. The, the discernments we're collecting are not discernments on how tasty is ice cream. Right. Or, or, you know, how fast is my car or how great my wife is. It's rather how the creator works in the world. It's like the, the God is the creator. He's the director mm -hmm. of the movie. I want to become like the director because I also want to direct in the movie. I want control. So in order to get control, I need to learn what does it mean to have control? What is involved? How does the creator work? How does the creator, you know, manipulate people? Because if we say there's only one force in the world and he's controlling everything, including me, then how does he control me? How does he, he makes that person angry. Then he suddenly makes everyone happy afterwards. How does, how does he work? Like sometimes we'll see that we only want happiness, but we'll see that what actually brings those moments of happiness is the tension before it. So then if we were taking this, this, this control into our, into our um, consciousness, instead of being in our subconsciousness, then does that mean we have to enable situations of tension and actually allow them to happen? Aware, like be aware of it, because we know that afterwards we'll actually get more happiness from it? Yeah observation so like the we're being acted upon and we're observing the actions and making the discernments according to those actions that are being made on us so what you're saying is we're be we're uh, becoming like the creator we're not replacing the creator well we actually are becoming the creator it's like if i said to you is the subconscious part of you you would say yes if I said to you, is your thoughts part of you, you'd say yes. If I said to you that your consciousness is part of you, you'd also say yes. If I said your desire is part of you, you'd say yes. If I said your intention is part of you, you'd also say yes. The whole idea is to add the creator into that whole um, line, since they're all connected to each other. So the way it works is your creator, the creator defines your intention, which defines your desire, which defines your subconscious, your consciousness, your thoughts, your emotions, your speech, your action, and your reality. And that is the, li the, the sort of the... The, the connection, the process that happens. The whole correcting your intention is adding the creator into that mix. So instead of saying, there's me and there's the creator, and if you say that, then you're saying there's me and there's you and there's Laura and there's Shelly and there's Renee and, there's, and so on. Instead of saying that, you're saying, no, because I'm the creator and you're the creator and Shelly's the creator and Moshe's the creator, we all become one. And that is where we're unified in our root. We're unified in the goal. So we're not unified in that I have to come to you, Dennis, and now merge my organs with you and do transplants and be like, look, you see, me and, and Dennis are one. Look, we're, we're sharing the same heart and we have the same organs. And, and look, we, we're sharing the same hands like, you know, like these weird kids which are born from, you know, uh, when they're born from uh, intermixed families and then they like have four organs instead of two and stuff like that. Uh, that's not the goal. The goal is to be connected in our consciousness, to be connected to the root. And when we say, I'm the creator, not feel so uh, sort of pushed off by that, but the other way around, to feel empowered. If the creator is controlling me and I'm his expression, which means that everyone that I see is an expression of me, then it makes life much more interesting. Because if you're an expression of me and I'm an expression of you, and we're all connected to the same root, then we can actually connect. And that's called at the end of correction, where everyone's connected to that root. Is that the same thing as uh, engraving in the heart? Exactly. Yeah. Um, because it's in your consciousness, you feel it. What did Shelly say? She says, is it? Yeah, sorry. Go for it. I was saying, is that the same thing as engraving in the heart? You could say before the barrier, you, could, you might say that you're the creator, but you don't actually feel comfortable with it. You don't actually agree with it. And you might think of it as, you know, it might be the goal, but you couldn't like say it wholeheartedly. After the barrier, you can say it fully and have no problem saying it. And even though you know it's only part of it, it would be like saying, I'm the president of the United States, but I've just entered office. So you're not the full president of the United States since you haven't got all the experience that you would have if someone was there for four years, but you still can say, I'm the president of the United States. So the same is when you pass the barrier, you can say, I'm the creator, even though you know you're only part of him because you haven't got that full experience, you haven't got that full 
um, consciousness and awareness accordingly. I guess psychologically, you know, the president, there is only one office, so there is really only one president of the United States at a time. And with the creator, we are all the creator and we're aspects of it and we're all connected within that aspect of the creator. So by me being the creator doesn't take anything away from you being the creator because it is one. <laughs> I think that's the psychological thing that when people think, oh, well, I'm the creator, well, then you can't be the creator. So I, I can't be the creator, and but we are all the creator. We're aspects of the creator. It's even more than that. If you become the creator and I become the creator, that empowers me the more you become the creator. So that's the whole difference between external power and internal power. External power, there's only one person who can do it. So like if we're both want to become the president of the United States, only one of us will win. And the, you know, may the best man win or the best woman win. But when we're talking about internal power, the more people connect to that internal that internality, the more it empowers everybody else. That's why capitalists are so interested in helping others to pass the barrier. It's not because they're lovely, lovely people. It's because the more that other people connect and reach that power, the more it empowers them. It's like a, a power grid. The more vessels you have to contain power, the more you can express that power accordingly. So that's why capitalists only care about people that will actually want to pass, and they have no care for people who don't want to pass, precisely because all they're interested in is increasing their internal power, and they do that by getting others to get there as well. So that's like a pyramid. Um, when, you, when one goes up, you go up. Um. Exactly. But because it's an internal pyramid scheme instead of an external pyramid scheme, you, everyone actually gains. So unlike an external pyramid scheme where people lose, when they're at the bottom in an internal pyramid scheme, everyone gains because you, the only thing stopping you from reaching a certain level is your desire. So if you don't desire to advance, you won't. That's the only reason we're never at our next step is because we don't want to reach there. And then our whole concept is, you know, working with the environment to want to desire to reach that next step. The only thing stopping us from reaching our next step is because we don't want to. The only reason we're not currently at the end of correction is because we don't actually want to be at the end of correction. So the whole reason we work with the friends is because we want to reach that end of correction and we want to every time want to desire the next stage that we know that we don't desire. And um, so if someone is at the bottom at the end, it's because he wants to be at the bottom. And there's nothing, it's not that, oh, the first in, he's at the top. Everyone can reach the top and then everyone will be equal at the top or not. But that's every person's desire. So no one can say, oh, you've taken my slot. You know, what's interesting, um... You know, when he's saying when you go around the world, if everybody's the creator, right, and I'm the creator, and you're an expression of me, and everybody here is an expression of me, you're saying that also as I advance further, those expressions of me will change? What happened? I can't hear you. You're still uh, muted. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, they won't change externally. So it's not like, you know, if. If I go to my next stage, Dennis won't suddenly become younger, um, uh, no matter how much I try. <laughs> and oh, there, he's already dressed in matter. We're all dressed in some sort of matter. And, but the perception, the form, the perception that'll works. change, right? Okay. Yeah, that will change, yes. So because It's all about form and matter. And I was having major discernments about that, um, you know, of, of like, you know, you know, we, we got to stop thinking about, oh, I want this to happen because that's specifically dressed in matter but when you think about it in the form well i want these these feelings or this whatever states that i want to experience not dressed in matter that's a corrector approach uh, to think about right so it's just to stop fingering how you want it to present itself in reality and deal with more of um the the perception change that you want did yeah, i but, actually make it happen who knows yeah, but did you specifically said it was about one specific person or did you, because that's already, already dressed in matter. What I'm saying is, is more of like, maybe you didn't want a certain feeling to ha occur, which is the sort of the form element of it of like, oh, I don't want to be tied to this situation or this feeling and that I want to be released. And then in that way that another, some other event occurs to sort of release you of that 
you know, event. I don't know if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, I think um, it's a combination. So you need to have like this multi-layer thing. So you know why you don't want him to be your boss anymore. Um, so it's not you're just thinking of, I don't want him to be my boss. And someone asks you, why not? And you're like, I don't know. I just don't like him. It's like you need more internal uh, awareness of what exactly bothers me. He's um, affecting my independence because he's a low desire. So he's stopping me as a high desire from advancing. Um, and I don't, I don't want that to happen. And so you need all the levels. It's not just like, oh, I'll just focus on I want to be happy and then something will happen. You need a connection between the top and the bottom. So you need a connection. How is this going to help me get to the goal? Because at the end of the day, the, cre- the only um, reason the creator is going to answer it is because it, it serves his goal as well. Sure, sure. But I was curious. I was having um, uh, deliberation about this the other day. I was like, well, what, I mean, is it really possible to, to really sort of be so targeted about certain people or certain things? But then I was like, well, if you're the creator, you can do everything. <laughs> but then I was thinking, <laughs> but this is dressed in matter. So I can't be thinking about it in matter. I have to thinking about above that, you know, sort of, you know what I'm saying? So the idea is, again, you need a connection. If it's one to become a desire, you need something to hold on at the end, some physical result. Because otherwise, why, why are you wanting something to change? So you want well, yeah. something to change physically at the end. Like, otherwise, like, sure, oh, sure. I want to be just better. Like, okay, that's not a desire. You need something that has all the levels from the goal. How is this going to help me get close to the goal? And well, also how it's going to manifest physically. Well, what I'm saying, okay, let's just give a very basic example here. Let's, I mean, I know this is not really related to the goal, but let's just say, oh, I desire a BMW X6. Very specific on some, some something right some object okay and let's just say hypothetically that this was related to the goal and this was a you know a good desire to have um but is it really that that specific car that i'm desiring or the feeling that i'm gonna get that when i have this car it's gonna give me and and if i if that's the case then if i'm it's really the feeling that i want then i'm really desiring the feeling and if i got some other car that gave me that same feeling then that would still be correct but well, can I really be targeted to, to that particular car, to that pick everything? You know what I mean? One of the reasons why it says the last uh, of the Ten Commandments is you shall not covet someone's wife is precisely because our desires are so strong. And it's talking about a specific thing. So you're allowed to desire the car like someone. You're not allowed to desire someone's car. The reason why it's a, a commandment is because you could desire someone's car and that car would become yours. <laughs> Uh-huh. So, so that's why it's, it's forbidden um, because it could actually happen. So the idea is that when you're designing a specific car, it's not because you want just the feeling. You just, if I give you a virtual environment where you would feel like you're driving the car, but wouldn't actually get anywhere, that wouldn't work either. So you, at the end of the day, the, the reason why you want a specific car is not just because you can drive it. It's because of um, the emotional attachment while you're driving the car. And that's what advertisements do. They... Um, they know that the car itself doesn't mean very much at all. The difference between the cars is very little anyway. It's the emotional attachment they give you to the car that makes you buy a specific car of a specific brand of a specific type. And you can see it with phones. Like, you know, they show you a phone, a woman's running around the beach, you know, running around the beach with the phone. She's not even using the phone. But that emotional attachment between the phone and the woman makes you buy the phone. Sex sells. Exactly. <laughs> but but can everything see those. is an expression of sex. Exactly. I mean, everything is an expression of sex. And the whole, so like music, food, clothing, architecture, literature, it's all uh, an expression of sex. I heard the only thing which is not an expression of sex is sex itself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the, the idea is that you, you want the emotional attachment to it, and that's what advertisements are for. If, if you just give the text spec, who would buy it? Um, and it's always the emotional aspect. But you need also the device. You need the specs as, as well. You can't just have, oh, this phone will be great, but it can't make calls. Like, but look. So if you desire something so strongly, and you attach emotion to it, then you're able to bring that to you to, to help you 
uh, advance to the goal? The, the, the whole reason why we don't get specific things is because inside we're not aware of the internal conflict we have. Like, for example, anything we don't get is because we don't really want it. And the whole idea of, of prayer is, is going through those, those um, internal sections and finding out, wait a second, I might say I want to get married, but I don't really want to get married because I'll lose my um, independence. Um, I like to control stuff. But then you say to yourself, no, but I really want to get married. I really want to get married. And then uh, that's what friends are helpful for. They can help you cut through those, those desires and actually show you that it's the snake, snake skin where um, you, you think you want it, but you don't really. Like I do this with taxi drivers. They'll say, oh, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be rich. And then I break it down for them. And then in like two minutes, I'm able to expose to them they don't really want to become rich because they'll lose the hours. <laughs> um, exactly as I say. <laughs> but it's a rule in spirituality that you get what you desire. Exactly. So if you aren't getting what you're desiring, it's exactly what you just said, that then you're not actually really desiring it the way that you think you are. And that's why we're not in spirituality yet, because we don't desire it the way that it needs to be desired to get that. And everything, isn't everything really just subconsciously? Aren't we really just, um, everything is really a manifestation of wanting to be united with the creator within us. So subconsciously, all the things that we're doing is really getting us to that place, whether it looks like it's some other action, but it's really that underlying feeling of wanting to be unified. Exactly. I think some of the struggles are uh, of our desire is when it, when it does manifest itself, it's not what we expected, so we don't recognize it. Is that also a lack of desire? Can you repeat the question? I think the problem uh, with uh, desire is that when we desire something and something manifests itself, we don't recognize for what it is because it's not what we actually desired. Does that well, make what, sense? It's not what we thought we desired. We get everything we desire. So whatever we're getting, we actually desired it. <laughs> we just don't realize it. That's the trick is you need to break it all down now to realize that this is actually what I desired and why, what's stopping me from getting to what I think I want or what I really want, but I'm actually not there yet. Yeah, but that's part of the work. And like, you know, when you go about the day and something bad happens to you, like, well, I actually... You, and you get pissed off. You're like, well, why did this happen? Well, it's because I wanted it to happen, but I wasn't aware that I wanted it to happen. And then you, well, why did I really want this to happen? And then it's this inner tension inside of you. Like, oh, I want, okay, so let me, let me, let me try to have the sermons on this. And, you know, that's sort of the work of, of, of discovering more about yourself. It's like the people that do suicide aren't those who complain. You'll notice that the people that complain never do suicide, even though they might talk about it a lot. And those who do suicide are the ones that never talked about it. And like, oh, I never thought that that guy would do suicide. He was such a quiet guy. The reason he did suicide, it was because he was a quiet guy, because someone who complains, he gets so much enjoyment from complaining. Complain, complaining is the most easiest access to enjoyment there is, because nothing has to change and you get all the enjoyment from it. It's like, why is my wife like this? Why are my kids like this? Why is the world like this? Why is the president like this? Why is the creator like this? And it gives us so much enjoyment. Why would I do suicide? The whole idea of doing suicide is to, you know, escape pain. But if I'm complaining, the person's enjoying himself. That's why, that's why people love watching. Um, um, that's why people love complaining. I actually say that to people that when they're saying, oh, every, so many people are unhappy. I'm like, no, you think they're unhappy, but they're happy because we, we don't do anything that doesn't bring us pleasure. So they might look like they're unhappy, but they're actually happy being in that state that they are complaining and having all this disaster and they, they're they happy in that. They're happy complaining about it. So your idea that they're not happy, they actually are happy. Otherwise, it would change. 
so the people that have pain and don't complain, are they happy with having pain or what? I mean, that is also true. Um, I can tell you, like when I was younger, I was beaten up at school very badly. Um, today, I understand why it happened. It's because I wanted, um, I wanted uh, to exist. It's one of our fundamental uh, desires, is the desire to exist. And uh, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity. There's only publicity. Um, I know today that the reason why I was beat up many times was because I actually wanted that attention. And I, I knew that the easiest way to get that attention was by, you know, basically having an L written on my forehead of being a loser. And I basically invited them to, to be, beat me up. But it was all subconsciously. I didn't like think of it. Okay, I want attention. And the easiest way to get it is by causing them to, you know, want to beat me up. And therefore they beat me up and then I'll feel that I exist. Like that's all subconscious. And today I'm aware of that subconscious. So I know not to invite that kind of thing again, since I can get something much more qualitative instead of quantitative. That's actually the whole concept behind people that cut. They're cutting, you know, what cutting is people that actually cut their skin for, it's to feel that they exist. It, it sounds really ironic and just so backwards. And in psychology, it's like a whole field, but they're wanting to feel like they exist. And that pain makes them, makes them real. I've known several people over the years that would show their scars as kind of badges of merit. And it's just really kind of crazy, but well, when we're complaining, those are our scars. I mean, we all have, you know, we all showing our scars in some way. We may not be cutting scars, but when we're complaining about, oh, poor me, pity me, look at this horrible life that's been given to me. That's also, look at my scars, my badge of uh, life. Right, it's like the dead never complain. Um, I see this happen with students in Kabbalah that, those who want to annul and do what the teacher tells them to do, it's, that's what they want. Um, no one's forcing them to annul. Um, it, there's a fundamental, uh, Bala Salam has this uh, article in one of his students where he says, why are you riding the carriage with me? What, get your own carriage. Um, there's a tendency for students just, just want to be in their, in their teacher's um, shadow and they never want to actually evolve to become a teacher because that requires a lot of responsibility. So isn't it easier to just to get told by your teacher what to do and, and you'll reach the goal and everything will be happy? But then it's like there's two ways um, to get pleasure. One is called the line and the other is called the circle. Annulment is, is called the circle where you just annul to the teacher, you totally lose your existence and then you get pleasure, but it's of the minimum amount. It's called or nefesh, which is basically tranquility. It's the pleasure of tranquility, which is just death in a sense, because you're not moving. There's no movement and there's tranquility in that. And that's what you get from annulment. But if you go the line method, then it's all about increasing your ego, increasing your desire, wanting more, wanting power, wanting tension accordingly. And that is where the creator is taking us. So the circle is only a method basically for people that don't want to do the work because it's much easier to annul at the end of the day than to actually work and desire and actually become something powerful and uh, successful. It's much easier for people to stay on the side and say, Oh yeah, I just, you know, I annulled my community and I did what I was told and, and look, I've got a nice, happy life, tranquil life. Look at these people, these millionaires and these celebrities, they're, they're, they have lots of pain and frustration. Who would like to be like them? Look at them. They've got terrible lives. And that's what we convince ourselves. Now we don't have to do this externally. We can do this internally. Um, but that's, we, we, um, we desire that tranquility. That's the broken intention. The broken intention is that we actually desire death. And the corrected intention is that we want life, that we actually want the tension and power. It's like electricity. When is electricity turned off? When there's no tension. And when is electricity turned on? When there's tension. And if you take away that tension, the electricity is off. So if we take the tension away from our lives, we're basically wanting death. I know my ex-boss, He his desire and his dream in life, his aspiration was to get to the beach with some beautiful woman, with his family and a hamburger. That sums up his aspiration, which is an aspiration of tranquility, right? He just wants filling and that's it. And you give it that to him and he's working his whole entire life with pain and frustration to reach death, to reach tranquility, to reach filling. And that's a broken intention. And a corrected intention is I'm working my entire life with pain and frustration in order to reach more pain and frustration, to reach more power. 
intently. It's interesting of that word intention. It's in tension. <laughs> Yeah, the S and the T difference. I, I actually made the mistake at the beginning of writing intention with an S. But Zaka, you know, listen, if, I mean, I could, I could, I could tell myself this all day long and don't get me wrong. I do like when the, you know, when the tension does occur, I'm always telling myself, okay, great. This is great inner tension. Thank you very much. I'm getting more powerful. <laughs> right. But, but until I actually feel that power, I'm only lying to myself. And until I feel that power, I won't, won't really consciously want to ask for more of it. It'll only happen, you know, set by me, the creator, you know, through my rishimot that it's going to happen to me. But, but until I'm actually consciously feeling this power inside of me, then I can actually want to demand it more and more and not mind attention. So, I mean... That's what I'm saying is I can say to myself all day long, I want this tension because I'll get more powerful. But until I feel that power, I'm just lying to myself. Well, the idea is that... Uh, the best, have any of you... I'm sorry. I just <clears throat> have a question is that since you've been studying, I know many of you have been here studying Kabbalah much longer than I have, but do you feel your inner power growing? Have you discerned that among, among yourselves? I mean, do you, uh, in a period of a time, let's say six months a year, have you felt your inner power grow? Because I, I, for one, have. I have too. I'm, I'm not I mean, Yes, I mean, I, I feel my inner strength stronger. In many ways, it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> but well, I mean, it's a, I, I can feel that, and you know, it's like uh, it's something that I'm glad this came up because it's something I wanted to discuss. You know, I was going to ask Brent because he brought it up a while back in a discussion and stuff. But it, it is just, you know, a, an odd thing. I was just curious if others are feeling the same in the same amount of time their growth if they can actually feel that power, well, feel well, your platforms of power that you're growing within yourself. Well, I could say this from my, from, from my point of view, right? I've become uh, internally pretty much unstoppable from anybody else outside the society um, because just on, I, I, sort of in the power of my perception, meaning that they're puppets, complete puppets, and I'm not. And in a way that this is giving me internal power that I have understanding and perception of the world that they have no clue about and that puts me in a position of power in that way yes as far as me changing uh every aspect of my world i'm not there yet but the perception is there definitely more internal strength i 100 percent one of the things i've been getting uh the feeling over the last couple of years that i've been studying this is if we kind of think about this stuff in the corporeal mind you go mad because it just doesn't compute it doesn't work out and to see it with the, uh, the spiritual mind, basically, on the upper world, it, it makes a lot of sense. Perfect sense. I, I too, uh, have been experiencing um, many um, thoughts of fear and overwhelming um, energies uh, spiraling inside me and I, I feel like Rick I feel like oh my gosh <laughs> it is scaring the hell out of me too at times and at other times I'm just so astounded at what I've discovered about myself and and everything around me with power comes responsibility now if you want to become like the creator or become the creator that's a lot of power to wield um, and that's and that's part and that's part of the reason that's part of the reason why suddenly if you didn't know how to wield that internal power you could cause you know greater havoc. You suddenly get angry at someone and you're like I wish you'd burn in hell and suddenly you know he gets inflamed like you're like oh I didn't really mean that to happen immediately. And and um, and I have an article that has just been published in Hebrew of Bala Sulam where he says that those who have no control over their um, you could say emotions and mind don't get to pass the barrier because why would you get that power if you, you know, if you can't control yourself, if you, if you can be the creator and you would like, you know, sentence your neighbors to death and they actually died, that, that would be a, you know, that wouldn't be very good. You want to be able to have control of that power and actually. Open
that's why we need to watch what we think and what we speak and what we feel then. Well, it's less about what we speak because many times we just speak and we have no actual desire behind what we speak. Um, you'll, send, you'll find many people, you know, that dogs bark, don't bite. Um, but the idea of the, and that's just because today the value of speech has, has been reduced over time. So it used to be that when people spoke, they spoke very little and therefore they said something, they meant it. And today speech has become a very um, uh, um, abundant commodity. Um, but uh, it's more about the desire. And one of the things, there's nothing to worry about. So it's not like, oh, I need to worry about what I do and what I think. When you reach that point, then you'll get the power. It's not you have to worry about, oh, I already have the power and I can really use it for bad. You'll get the power when you can handle it. And that's one of the ideas that we can't break. Um, we can't break before the barrier because we don't actually have enough internal power. And even after the barrier, when we break, it's the breaking of our intention. So it's not, the desires never break. So we don't have to worry about something yielding this power for bad things. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get, as we mature, um, our desires will mature um, accordingly and we'll, we'll want less, we'll still want, we'll, I say like this, we'll still desire physical things, we'll still do physical things, but we won't aspire to them. Um, and we'll, our maturity will automatically give us that control over our, our speech and our actions. What's, that's one of the ideas why Kabbalah says that don't worry about your actions in speech. Worry about your intention because the result of your intention is your desire, subconscious, conscious thoughts, um, emotions, speech, and actions and reality. So just focus on the intention, focus on correcting your intention, and that will already cascade accordingly down to the bottom, including your, your speech and actions. The reason why someone steals or the reason why someone takes drugs is not the problem that they're taking drugs or that they're stealing. That's just the side effect. That's just the result. And stopping him from stealing won't actually solve the problem. The problem is, why is he stealing? What is, what is the desire behind it that is dictating him to steal? And that's what needs to be dealt with and not, oh, he's stealing? We should just you know, stop him from stealing. It's like, it's like having you know, a, um, a heat, uh, what's called a fever, and just taking a pill to take away the fever. Like sometimes you want to do that, but if you're constantly doing that and you have a long fever, you should probably take care of it not by just taking a pill to get rid of the fever, you've got an internal problem that you have to take care of in your body or even in your, your psychology. Um, and the problem is most of the time we see something and we only want to like cover it up externally. It's like seeing, you know, you're seeing something on your screen and you put a piece of paper on top of the screen so you can't see it anymore. It's like, oh, there's this pop-up I don't like. And you plaster on top of it some kind of piece of paper. That's not going to take the pop-up away. It's just covering it. You have to actually go into the internals of the computer and make a change in the software that will remove the pop-up from being displayed. And the same is in our lives. We want to plaster things on instead of actually dealing with the core of it. The problem is never what you say and what you do. The problem is the intention behind it. And that's what we're trying to correct. It's like treating the symptom rather than the disease. Exactly. exactly. Right. The intention is always, I mean, the broken intention is that it, we don't want to, we don't realize or aware or we, we don't want to be the creator. And that's our whole purpose is to become the creator, to reveal him and become him. And so all of our actions are really that are away from that are to make us aware that we haven't internalized that yet. We haven't become aware and we're not on the path correctly. And so, I mean, it's a subconscious thing, which is also the creator and it's the communication. But when someone's addicted, it's really screaming at them. You're not in alignment with your true purpose. I mean, that's what everything really is, is that, that you're not in alignment with your true purpose. Exactly. Well, folks, I need to go take a shower before this evening. I just Thank stopped in much. from working sweating so thank you that's awesome uh discernments here the letter i didn't get to hear it all but from what i did hear i'm glad i made it thank you thanks rick thank you very much rick. see you rick bye. bye rick thank you very much for coming
Thank you for it's inviting great. us. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. It was, uh, it was really awesome. Thank you. Thank you for letting me tip into the group. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you. That's nice. We should do this again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.